It's time for Pure Performance. Get your stopwatches ready. It's time for Pure Performance with Andy Grabner and Brian Wilson. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Pure Performance. My name is Brian Wilson, and as always, my right-hand man, my left-hand man, my front-hand man, my whatever, my beacon of light in this dark universe, Andy Grabner. <laughs> Hi, Andy. That was, hi, that was a new one, the beacon of light. I've never heard, I never heard that. It just came to me. I was inspired by probably the lights behind you in your video. Okay. Um, Talking about video, we don't have a video, but we took a screenshot earlier where we will actually let people maybe on Twitter look behind the scenes a little bit, what's happening here. Yes. And, um, well, Andy, it's, it, I haven't talked to you for 24 hours, so great to talk to you again. Yeah. Uh, the beard is still the same length as yesterday. And no, you it's look, grown a little bit. Yeah, just a little bit, yeah. yeah no, but other than that, not a whole lot of things have happened uh, since nope. yesterday. Uh, great episode, though, on uh, securing the um, delivery pipelines and uh, kind of making sure that um, you are protecting, what did he call it? The uh, supply chain, the delivery supply chain right. of software. Uh, we had uh, Michael Plank or Michi on from Dynatrace explaining how we produce uh, secure software, which was also great because we talked about continuous delivery with a security aspect. And maybe this also gives our guests some additional ideas on what he wants to talk about today, because we have, uh, and hopefully I pronounce your name correctly, Baruch, uh, on the call today. Uh, I will let you introduce yourself, but I just have, before I let you go, I, I, I obviously see you on Zoom, so I really love the way you look, like your head, your beard, it's just perfect. Uh, if anybody <laughs> wants to see him, just uh, open up LinkedIn, search for him, Baruch, uh, DevOps Advocacy at JFrog. Really cool, uh, really cool outfit. Just love it. Uh, but now, please introduce yourself to the guests, to our, to our listeners. Sorry. Thank you very much, Andy. Thank you very much, Brian, for having me. My name is Baruch Sadogurski, and my business card and my LinkedIn says that I'm the chief sticker officer in Jeffrog. And uh, this is what uh, I do in times other than pandemics. I give people stickers when I meet them in uh, conferences and meetups <laughs> and uh, and uh, everywhere um so uh, uh yeah um also i'm the head of uh, devops advocacy with jfrog so i'm uh, i'm leading the team of our um, devops advocates um and uh, you know it's it's a part of developer relations and everything that comes with it interacting with people hearing what's their pains and trying to come up with solutions that will help them produce software faster, more reliably, better, and uh, generally for the pleas of their users and their managers. Pretty cool. Now, looking at LinkedIn, uh, you live in California, so on the West Coast. Yes. But I guess people can, act, uh, can, can guess by your accent that you... You are not a native Californian. Where are you from? Uh, yeah, yeah. So uh, I uh, I was born in Russia. I lived most of my life in Israel. And uh, yeah, now I'm here in the States. Yep. See, wow. I, th I thought that was a Valley accent. Uh, the, valley, <laughs> the funny thing about Valley accent is that everything is Valley accent. Yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, we, we have people from all over. So whatever accent you hear, That's you valley. Yep. consider it as a Valley accent. So, Baruch, uh, I think the way I reached out to you, I actually saw a couple of posts on LinkedIn by one of your colleagues, and uh, he's been posting a lot of cool content, educating people on the latest and greatest on Kubernetes and all sorts of things. And then I reached out to him. I said, hey, it would be great to talk. And then he said, well, he's just posting content, but he's really not the expert. We have to talk to you. And then I said, well, then introduce me to Baruch because I want to I wanna talk to you because then... I also found uh, the, the book that I have in front of me, or the electronic version of it. It's called Liquid Software. And this is really what is kind of the, the theme of today's podcast. Because first of all, liquid software sounds like a really cool term. Um, you mentioned that in your role, you want to help people build better software faster. 
So it's kind of what we all, I think, have you know tried to achieve. But I really like the term liquid software, and I would love to talk about it. What is this all about? Also, how does this differentiate what other people say when they talk about continuous delivery, um, continuous I mean, continuous delivery, continuous deployment? What what is liquid software different, or is it the same, or you know, how does this work? But in the end. What can you, based on your experience, tell our listeners on how they, in the end, produce better software faster? That's that's a great question, and um, obviously, thanks, Pavan, for 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 this introduction and for um, making you invite me. Uh, and uh, yeah, Liquid Software um, is a concept that one of Jeffro co-founders, Fred Simon, came up with. Uh, and the idea about it is um, continuous updates. We're going to talk about continuous updates in a second, but on grand scheme of things is you update your software so frequently and with so tiny intervals and in, in such a small deltas that it almost looks like the software is flowing from the producer to the consumer. And this is the idea of liquid software. Mm -hmm. um, um this idea um, i think he came up with it maybe i guess like three or four years ago and um it it became more than just the vision it became actually methodology which is called continuous updates and uh, then a couple of years ago a uh, uh, he other jeffro co-founder you have landman and yours truly a uh, we wrote a book it's called liquid software how to achieve continuous updates with devops and uh, um, this is the book that um, Andy you, you you refer to, mm -hmm. uh, and it's it's a lot like other continuous things in our space. Uh, it obviously all have roots in continuous integration back in the '90s, and then uh, a continuous uh, continuous delivery uh, with uh, Martin Fowler and 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 Jez Humble. Uh, and this is a continuation of all the continuous things. That's the next continuous thing. There are some interesting differences between continuous delivery and continuous updates. And I would say that um, continuous updates just shift the, the focus a little bit. While continuous delivery is by definition delivery of any software, new versions, new applications and updates, Continuous updates uh, focuses on the part where you are not, uh, most of your releases, 90 whatever percent of your releases is not blank slate, is not clear slate. You are not delivering new software in a vacuum. Instead, mm -hmm. on the other side, there is something that is already running and your goal now is to update, not necessarily um, roll out new software. And there are interesting aspects about that um, that we try to highlight in the continuous update uh, updates methodology, mostly uh, that you need to be aware of the state, that um, what do you do with breaking changes, how do you work in the way that your customers at least are not even aware that there is a version change of the software. Mm -hmm. Because what we think about and what we envision is something like whenever you need to update the software, you are not installing a new version of the software. It's just something that is changed inside the version that you already have. Think about um, the, all, the, all the latest and greatest browsers, Chrome, Firefox, and what's not you are not aware which version of the browser are you running. It's just once in a while, it gets new capabilities. Mm -hmm. And this is exactly, you, 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 don't, you don't think in terms of versions, right? They are on version 84. It doesn't mean much. What means is, well, they are now have such and such new capability. You know what? Google Meet now works better. And you don't even know Google Meet what be works better because the backend changes that they did, or maybe because your browser now supports a new protocol. You don't even know that. You don't think about it. All you know in terms of consumers, well, yes, yeah, since yesterday, Google Meets works better. Hmm. Does it make sense? That makes a lot of sense. So does this also mean from 
A couple of questions here. On the on the first, the first question is more technical and the way we approach than software engineering. Do we need to engineer that the software we build is updatable, easily updatable by default? Like, is this a new capability that we have to bake into our architecture and our software? Yes. Yes. So there are changes that we need to to make, and you know what? The first and foremost in the concept of how we plan for updates. And basically, once we give up this notion of we are going to increment in versions and everybody needs to be aware of them, we, the customer, other components of our system, suddenly you are in different mindset. Say, okay, there is a certain state, not a version, but a state of software that might exist in my entire ecosystem. In um, one of the customers can have one state of the software. The other can have another state of the software. My dependencies can be in different state. And then you need to plan ahead for, 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 for all of that. It sounds more complicated. The version sounds easier. There are compatible versions and not compatible versions. And this is pretty much all. But on the other side, it also gives you the flexibility to be backwards and forwards compatible out of the box. You just leave within the concept of a single version unless, until there are changes which you have to make them breakable. Mm -hmm. But when that happens, you just declare, hey, I have a new ver new software now. It's not a next version. It's just completely new software. It's a little bit like if you're familiar with the version in Gingo, how they how they did it in in Go modules, mm -hmm. uh, breakable versions like version two for Go for 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 the machine, it's a completely new dependency. Right, mm -hmm. the URL in the in the import changes, and it means for the um, uh, for the dependency manager, mm -hmm. it's a it's a new version. It doesn't mean that it's called the same. As long as the version changed, it might be called completely different. It's exactly the same as other, any other another dependency, and this is where the difference between updates of an existing software and installing new software kicks in. And then we say, well, okay, that's a new software. Now we installed it. Let's start operating with continuous updates within this next version. Mm -hmm. Now, how does this work in, you know, a lot of people are moving towards smaller services. You know, that's, you know, let's take the term microservices, even though people, some people have problems with it. But if we have service A and B, do I then, as a consumer of a service, if I'm A and B has different versions, do I have to have specific code for all the different permutations of versions that version that, so, that service B has? Right? We, we work with loose coupling and encapsulation for like, what, 40 years now? This is exactly the same concept. As mm -hmm. long as your APIs are backwards and comp forwards compatible, and we know how to do that, you can change your service every day. And no one, no one around you should um, should, should feel it. Yeah. Yes, it requires more discipline in terms of changes, but that's mm -hmm. not new. Semantic yeah. versioning has a very very detailed uh, uh, protocol on what uh, can be break, can be broken and when. Yes, we don't follow that, but that's because we're humans and we make mistakes. This is not going to change. There is no way. Suddenly, when you give up the versions and uh, talk about liquid software, that people are going to make less mistakes. No, we, we are not climbing that. We are aware that this problem will remain, and um, it will be the same problem as with semantic versioning. It's just we simplify the idea by saying, consider it all the same version until it's not. And mm -hmm. what it gives us is, once we already do that, is obviously seamless updates when people are less reluctant to update just because uh, because why not it's 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 the same version and whatever changed shouldn't break it will it break it probably it will does is there any any other solution there is really none 
It's mm-hmm. not more risky. It's the same amount of risk. And the risk comes from the idea that people suck. <laughs> <laughs> we we uh, said that in yesterday's recording. Yeah. Talking no, about no, security and all this stuff going on. It's because yeah. people suck. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, in your book, uh, do you cover a couple of, let's say, you know, let's call it best practices or things what developers can do, especially around uh, version discovery and then based on the, the versions that they discover from the dependent services that they also change their behavior. Is there any, is, are there any best practices around uh, testing? Because obviously we will have more and more different versions and combinations of versions. Are there best practices around that as well? Absolutely. Well, but here again, the more load on versioning doesn't come from continuous updates. It's the other way. It Well, yes, there are more uh, options of permutations uh, f- from, from uh, different integration, integration points, but this is just the outcome of having smaller batches. Mm-hmm. And having smaller batches is not something which is new, unheard of, or something that we don't want. It's the other way around, right? The entire Agile and DevOps are about having smaller batches. So mm-hmm. the, the fact is, the reality is we have smaller batches. We have more complicated matrix of testing. And mm-hmm. we don't make it more or less complicated. It's the same idea. What we just say is expect people to really have all those combinations and not only the combinations that for some reason you decided that people should have. In the end of the day, this is a lie. People will have whatever combinations they will have. And if you don't test them because you think they are impossible, then you just don't do your tests well enough and not that they're really impossible. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, now, from moving away from software engineering, but more to the way we plan software, also how we are releasing things to the market. I think you said something very interesting earlier where you said, well, back in the days, we talked about version one, version two, version three. This is mostly, or at least for the, like you mentioned, the browser, the Chrome example, this is gone. Nobody cares about which version of, of Chrome I'm on. At Dynatrace, we also, I mean, we internally have numbers. These are sprint numbers, but nobody cares about the number anymore because we know when certain, if a certain capability is there. Exactly. But it, that also means that we have to fundamentally also shift towards value creation teams, I guess, where we say, hey, we're not planning on this big release that we call, I don't know, February of 2021, but hey, we have five value streams going on. And as soon as the individual ones are ready, we may push it out. We may update it and then give the customer the opportunity to either get it automatically or maybe I think in your uh, in the part of the book that I wrote, you also mentioned, I think, mobile apps how we, on the, on the mobile side, obviously, we have to click on a button and say, we want to update now. But we don't update to a certain version. We just say, give me the latest because I get these capabilities. You now, nailed it on the head. The entire, mar- the entire version thing is completely marketing, right? Mm-hmm. It's, the, it's the ability for marketing to talk about a bunch of features together and give them a common name. This is what it is. Mm-hmm. And obviously, it requires a change exactly there. And um, I think that the, uh, the idea uh, that we see more and more liquid software and the browsers it's, is, is still a very good, idea, a good example is because this is where uh, the marketing pressure was the lowest. And this is how um, they managed to, 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 to put it through because you don't really do a lot of marketing around versions of, of your browser. The other things, you still are. Think about, uh, I don't know, whatever software you're using uh, on your desktop. It will always be, hey, there is new version 9 and this is three pages of new features and for all those features, you want to pay us $99. For, for yeah. the upgrade. But the good news are that the, the market is shifting very rapidly to a subscription model, right? You just pay money um, monthly and then you will just get whatever new features there are. And this is what enables 
us to move to liquid software without hurting the bottom line. Because once you already pay for subscription anyway, marketing doesn't have to make the updates, batches large enough and lucrative enough to kind of convince us to upgrade. Mm -hmm. No one cares. We already pay anyway. So just Mm -hmm. give us, uh, just give us the versions and just give us the latest numbers and uh, the latest, the latest features. And, and, and this is where a, our opportunity lies. We can steer away from versions because the the biggest opposition of having bulk, um, uh, the biggest case for having the bulk updates the marketing story now shifts to uh, uh, to subscriptions, and then they don't care anymore. See, I absolutely abhor subscription model. <laughs> I understand your point of view, but I, I, th- I think the way you described it as empowering the uh, the team to just be able to continually release and put features out that makes absolute sense to me. Though, like just personally, I, I like. I don't want to, if I paid for my software, I want to pay for it, be done with it and not think about paying for it again, unless there's actually a reason that I want those new features. And I'm talking about not necessarily business. So like I do a lot of audio stuff, right? And yeah, no, bro, but it's, it's the same. And, and, and yeah. that's a very valid, that's a very valid point. And um, I would say two things. First, um, no one cares what you want or what I want. Right. right, the, the business the market. moves. The business moves to a subscription model because the companies that provide a steady um, stream of uh, income from subscriptions right. are more successful, and this is why uh, this is why it actually um, happens. So there is no uh, there is no way way around that. But also, when you say about you know what, let's try and imagine how we can marry continuous updates with perpetual licenses. And you say, you know what, I only want to pay for when I see when I see a value. And um, I'm telling you, okay, I'm going to update your software almost every day. Sometimes it will be, or more than once a day. Sometimes it will be um, uh, bug fixes. Sometimes it will be new features. How do you see you can stay on top of that and pay for whatever you want. How do you even know if out of three bug fixes that I released today, you want two and don't care about the third? Yeah. And I think it's a fair point. I think, I think it all comes down to to the software that you're using. Like, so for, in my mind, while you were describing that, I was thinking about my, my audio software. Yeah, no, it's, it's and and in that case, in that case, it's like, if I don't have bugs, if it's working fine, I don't want bloatware because oftentimes things get bloated as you go on. If, if my system is running and my systems are processing, I don't want to touch them. You so know, again, but that's a do? different case. That's a completely different case. Anyway, this yeah. is, I think, no, as, no, as, it's a, I, a religious it argument. Because, uh, Brian, yeah. I, I, I love it because it's a, it's a very valid objection. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And and who, who owns the software that we're going to update? And then I would say the solution will be you can stop paying for the service whenever you feel your software is feature complete and work as expected, and then you get the perpetual license for whatever you already have. If they offer that, that's the key. Some, some yeah, no, if you're not paying, you don't about, get it. Yeah. We're talking about the vision, right? We're talking yes, about exactly. how to solve the liquid software, how to marry the liquid software vision with the idea that you want to own your software. So yeah. that can be one idea. You can say, you know what? This my audio processing software is I feel it's feature complete. I don't need new features. I also don't encounter a lot of bugs. I want to freeze it in time. I want this. Here is the money. Yeah. And, well, I already paid the money. I don't want to pay anymore. <laughs> and I and I will own what I already paid for. Well, obviously, for this is where we kind of disconnect you from the continuous updates that your software uh, uh, got. And you uh, have what you have. Next time you want something, we will install, as I mentioned, a completely new software on a blank slate, and we will start continuing the updates from there on. Yeah. And on the flip side, on the flip side, in terms of the solution, because I, I think it's yeah. great that you turn that into a solution, I would just say on the flip side of the solution would be that if things are subscription based, 
they actually get updates and they get the improvements and these things are actually going on. Because I think what happens is a lot of people will switch to subscription base, but they're not continuously delivering, which is where probably a lot of the pushback, I think in a perfect, and in, in again, vision wise, in a great world, if you are going subscription based, it's because you can deliver on that promise and you're bringing value. And if that were the case, then I probably wouldn't have the issue with it that I do now. So it's, it's a chicken or egg. Anyhow, we kind of went off on what Andy would go on a little bit of a call, probably a little bit of a religious argument but, there. But, no, but Brian, I, I want to have, I want to give an example that actually happened to us. Remember, yeah. we, had, we went through two or three different uh, subscription-based services to record podcasts. Yeah. Would we have paid a big upfront cost for the first software we used? We would have been really mad mm -hmm. because we didn't like it. But yeah. we had the ability to say, well, we don't extend for another month and we just jump to something else. And then we tried that. And in the end, it turned out again, we had problems <laughs> with it, right? But yeah. at least I think this model also allows you to switch faster. I mean, obviously, depending on the software uh, or the service, but I think it also makes it easier to switch for the consumer. And this is also, I think, the motivation, obviously, for really successful companies to continuously improve the service and bring new features faster than their competition because they know otherwise they cannot retain their customers. Yeah. Right? I mean, yeah. And I think it's, it's a great idea. And I think it's, uh, as we say, th this, the concept, just like when the concept of, let's say DevOps came out or even agile, right? There was the idea and there's the idea is way out here and everybody's back here, and, you know, towards the beginning I need to work. And I think with the liquid software concept, very similar, you have some people who are actually delivering on it, who are actually doing these things well. And then you have other people who are saying, oh, we'll just charge for that concept, but we're not there yet. But yep. if that gives them the inspiration then to get to that endpoint so that we are delivering better software faster, bringing value to everybody, then I'm all, I'm all, all, I'm all in on it. I'm, I guess I was just like looking at more of it, like, where is it now? Um, which is just, you know, yeah, I was, I'm just, I'm grumpy today. So sorry. <laughs> no, no, but this is great. That's exactly kind of problems that, and and questions that we need to answer and yeah. it's it's great that someone is 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 asking them and i love it and obviously there are a lot of um uh, um uh, combinations of marketing and sales and technical which are not aligned yet yeah but the move to services even if we hate it in the in the, uh, to subscription even if we hate it in in some particular use cases is still a huge enabler for liquid software because yeah. we don't need to fight with marketing anymore. We don't need to tell to to, to um, th th they now won't tell us. But wait, we need the change log to be able to sell this upgrade. And um, for for us, for the technical people, it's it's critical because um, liquid software couldn't have have any success without the switch in sales and marketing strategy. So what I'm saying is that there is a great opportunity now to catch up with the sales and marketing and business and actually provide value in the way that will make the subscription model make sense even for you, Brian. When you see that your <laughs> software is constantly getting more value, you will say, you know what? I know what I'm paying for. I don't feel cheated. And I'm yeah. fine with paying whatever 10 bucks a month. And if you think about it from a business point of view, that makes a lot of sense too, because in, in that ex ex exact example, I'm not upgrading to the latest version because it's going to cost me like $150 to upgrade to the latest version of my recording software. And there's no compelling features in the update. You know what I mean? Like, it's like, I don't need any of those features they put in there. Everything else is minor tweaks. I'm like, eh, you know, sometimes it's great, but like to them, from a business point of view, it almost hurts them. Right, because what they put in that package in that big version, right, didn't have enough to compel me to put the money into it. No now, one, no one will upgrade. Now that they're not going to get the money from me, so how do they keep paying their developers to put out the next stuff? I mean, I'm exactly. I'm, I'm one person, but exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's I very didn't interesting. Upgrade to the latest to the latest Fantasia because none of the whatever they put in the upgrade wasn't there. But instead, if they were on services, and I was hooked up on their, on their, uh, not on services, on subscription. And I was hooked up on their subscription because once in a while, there is something that I want. I wouldn't probably cancel just because, well, in some month or some day, I didn't see anything. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Interesting. Thanks. Yeah. New, 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 new way of viewing it. 
Yeah. So, uh, Baruch, when I read through your paper, or your book, uh, I took a couple of notes. And I got to say, I read it before the Christmas break. So I don't recall every single chapter. But I have a couple of items that are highlighted here in my notes. And one is called metadata. The importance of metadata, metadata about every artifact, where it came from, where it's running, quality, which security checks were done, which performance tests were executed. So I took some notes. I'm not sure if they came one-to-one -one out of your book or if I then just uh, scribbled down some of my notes because I highlighted the performance tests because Brian and I, we are uh, by heart performance engineers. So can you tell us maybe a little bit more about this metadata and, and, and why it is so important and, and you know, what people need to understand and maybe think of when they're building their containers, their apps and services? Why is metadata, why did you highlight it? Why yeah, it so, uh, so metadata is critical because there is all that's left once the version is going away. When you look at the artifact, at the moment, you will probably be able to know which artifact is it because the file name usually contains some kind of identificator. Is it a build number or a version number or a commit uh, a, a SHA or, or, or anything like that? Mm -hmm. And then you can start after a long and painful investigation and get to what this artifact really is, how it was built, what is the source, where it was during different uh, points in the, in the pipeline. Basically, if you have any identification of the artifact, you will be able to, in the end of the day, find what, what this artifact is and, and, and information about it. Now, obviously, it's even today, if you just have the name of the service dash 3.7.5, it's still very hard to find anything. But, but if you don't even have that, then what do you have? If we get away of versions and we say, well, every artifact can be of any, uh, um, you know, it's, it's the result of any build, how do we know? Well, this is where the metadata comes into play. And we can say that the identification of the file, we know it. And that will be the, the, the checksum of the file. Assuming that checksums are unique, if you take a, a certain array of bytes, which is our, our software or, or a module, it translates to a unique checksum. And then we can go to our database of DevOps, if you wish, and ask, what is this? Um, uh, what is this artifact? Mm -hmm. And this is where all the metadata that you collected through your pipelines, and it starts with the um, source control um, uh, um, uh, revision and mm -hmm. um, everything that associated with that, uh, the commit notes and, and the issues and, and everything else that came from source. And then everything that happened to this artifact through the pipeline, how it was built, what was the environment variables in the CI server, what was the settings that this build was configured with. And then every step of the way in the testing pyramid in our promotion pipeline, how, which tests were run, how was the security, how was the performance, how was that. Everything about this checksum has to be um, has to be captured, and uh, this is critical because otherwise, you you know nothing. Mm -hmm. right? This is why metadata becomes more and more important. And as we mentioned, as we have more and more permutations of what should interact with what and how with um, smaller batches, faster releases, and microservices the information about how everything works with everything else becomes critical. And this is the metadata that you need to capture for every artifact that you have under their checksum, under the only true identifier that every file in the universe, any array of byte in the universe have. Does it make sense? Mm -hmm. It's almost like it's genome. 
It, it is. In it's, it's exactly that. It's exactly the same idea. And again, the, the, the idea that the only thing you care is how this array of bytes represented in a unique fingerprint in the mm -hmm. checksum liberates you again from the concept of versions and um, the entire set of problems of overridden versions and mutable versions. And well, are we sure we didn't build again under the same version number and, and all this kind of crap. This crap just doesn't exist anymore. Once you say, all I care is a content of this array of bytes. This is its identifier, its unique fingerprint in SHA-256, in SHA-512, uh, whatever you feel comfortable with mm -hmm. uh, that won't ever create any conflict with any other array of bytes in your system. And this is my identifier that I first attached all the information that I could possibly find, collect, and, and know about this artifact. And now I can use query language. I can use UI. I can use whatever I want to examine this metadata and make smart decisions about it, how it should be deployed, to which clients it should be um, delivered, or uh, how a certain problem happened and how do I investigate and how do I solve it. Mm -hmm. Now, are there any standards for this? Because the reason why I'm asking, uh, as you know, Brian and I will work for Dynatrace. So when we monitor environments, we see hosts, we see processes, we instrument code. From a process perspective, we see, you know, what, what type of runtime is it? Which, which binaries get loaded? Which char files get loaded? So we have a lot of metadata about these files. Or when we talk about container workload monitoring, we are extracting labels and annotations from your deployment descriptions. And I know on Kubernetes, there are some, let's say, uh, best practices already, like how you're passing in version information, application affiliation, environment information. Is there something that you explain here with like a fingerprint, like your, uh, your, your, your SHAs, is there something that is actually kind of, is a standard for that where the industry is kind of has already started on agreeing that every time we deploy a container, the unique fingerprint should be, you know, part of that particular label or something like that, because that would be interesting for us as well on the Dynatrace side, because we can then pick it up. And then I guess integrate or make a query to your tools, right? Your the JFrog provides and say, hey, give me more information about this artifact because we are just detected in production. There is a performance problem. Yeah. So unfortunately, uh, or maybe fortunately, it's an opportunity. There is no, um, yet there is no like an industry standard of how do we collect, how do we store, and how do we use this metadata? There were in the past some attempts, and I think the most notable uh, was uh, from uh, Google and a lot of different companies, including JFrog, um, uh, Graphius. I, I, I mentioned it in a book. There is a chapter about Graphius as well, but um, unfortunately, it didn't didn't go anywhere. Um, we in JFrog are uh, uh, trying to come up with a model that will fit uh, at least um, our part of the universe, which is how do we label artifacts with the metadata um, across the, the entire pipeline, starting from the source all the way to distribution to the runtime, whatever this runtime is, um, container clusters or edge devices or or your laptop or whatever, um, and uh, we do it um, uh, in an open standard of, it's not a standard, it's just ours, our standard, a, of we called the build information and the a, um, a distribution information, and this is just documents uh, that describe this um, uh, the, the, this metadata. They are um, uh, open source and they are machine readable, obviously, for automate around it. And obviously, they are parsed inside our tool uh, for um, operations with it, like promotions, using the build info, 
mm-hmm. and uh, obviously also also in the UI. Uh, so uh, yeah, um, we um, think about and those are early days. I I don't want to commit to anything that we won't be able to deliver, but we think about doing more with 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 those formats and mm-hmm. kind of try and popularize them and maybe see um, if the community will want to adapt those just because they are very well um, thought about. Uh, Mm -hmm. We are uh, doing the build info part, for example, uh, since 2009. So that will be be 11 years that the build info concept and format uh, is in continuous improvement. Um, Mm -hmm. And um, we'll see if that's something that works for the community and the industry, go figure maybe that will become the standard at least de facto for capturing, managing, uh, and using the metadata about artifacts. Mm. Oh, that's pretty cool. And so I think, you know, after this podcast, we should definitely start a conversation around how we on the Dynatrace side could potentially use this information or, you know, help you with our community to, um, to drive this more towards an, a more publicly accepted standard. The other area, and I know Brian, you will love this now because I will mention the word captain. I was I was going to mention it, Andy. Yeah. For my sake, I could see you pulling it into captain. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so because Baruch, we have an open source project called Captain where we are orchestrating uh, processes around delivery and operations. And basically we do a similar thing. We have a unique we call it a trace context. So we are tracing the life cycle of an artifact from its inception until it's in production. And with that, when something ends up in production and something happens, we can trace it all the way back to the initial push of the of the container, for instance, into a registry. Exactly, yeah. exactly, exactly. This is it. And that's that's the whole idea. And um, that's that's the big question, right? If If something happens and we have an artifact, what mm-hmm. is that? Yeah. How it was built, why it was promoted, which tests run, uh, and 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 from there we can uh, start investigate and and know what the problem was. Yep. Yeah. And by the way, thanks for. Just, oh, go on, Andy. No, I was just saying thanks for uh, sending over the link just now. We will definitely add this to the podcast proceedings, the build info. So GitHub, com, JFrog, build dash info. Yeah, and that's, as I mentioned, it's it's not in the form of kind of any official uh, proposal or anything like that. For now, it's pretty much an internal thing, but it gives you, it gives you kind of the idea of uh, what information, um, uh, what information we have there, why we are doing that and, and what's going on with that. And again, as I said, we are, we are, kind of thinking about taking it to the next step, making it thing of its own and start talking about it more um, as really, if not the standard, but at least um, an idea of how um, of, of how this metadata can be used and shared across. Uh, and uh, But that, that's, that's a good start. Mm-hmm. Yeah, got to start somewhere. I would also say I would want to put my two cents in to say, please make sure whatever happens with all this, it's 100% automated. Because if we rely on people doing it, we're going to be back at the same place we were with code comments, right? <laughs> Where no one's doing it. Just to pull this into a parallel world, something I never really talk about, obviously, on the podcast because it's not tech-related. But my daughter, um, she's on cannabis for her seizures. And f- for years, I've been making her extracts. And <clears throat> I see this as a very similar kind of a thing because – you know, I find one plant that works from one dispensary. Someone says, oh, can't you get it from another? I'm like, no, I can't because that's a name. That's a marketing name. It's a version number. It's whatever, right? The reality of what that's in that plant, whether it's cannabis, any other medicine, whatever that you're pulling from a plant, is the all the analysis that's done. So when you do the... Um, when you do the scientific analysis to find out which chemical components are in that extract which uh, terpenes and other components are all in there. That's the true marker of what that is. Yep. That's, that's all depending on the grow conditions, what's fed in the soil and everything else too. Same thing with your software. It's not about, oh, build number five, release 15, or, you know, the exactly. sometimes they get fancy names, right? It's those characteristics of deep, deep, deep characteristics what are in there 
that define what that is. And it's, it's really, really, really an awesome concept, um, mm -hmm. which applies and, to a lot of things. And again, you're 100% right. What, what's important here is the unification of, of, of the thing, right? It, it's uh, having the common language, having the common terms, and everybody are using it because otherwise it will just be fragmented marketing terms that everybody in, invests their own. Yeah. Right, and we can we can always compare it to standardized industries like wine making or what's not like comparing it with with cannabis, for example. When everybody come up with their own marketing term, and you go um, to the dispenser next door, and they have no idea what are you talking about when you're going to buy wine, and you say, "Hey, I want champagne." Everybody know exactly what you mean, and there cannot be any um, um, any disturbances again that. So yeah, yeah um, I, I think uh, that's the ultimate goal. And while we move away from versions, that becomes more and more critical. Yeah. Hey, I have one more section that I want to highlight uh, or that I want to ask you about. Kind of my, the end of my notes that I had when I read it. And I want to read it out loud because I really like it. I think it was one of the captions in your book. And it says, to error is human, to validate is robot. And I made some additional notes saying uh, rethinking Q&A and validation, go and no-go decisions have to be automated based on data processed by smart algorithms. It's kind of some notes that I took. And it plays perfectly also in stuff that we've been talking about, Brian and I, over the last couple of years, how we are using automation to extract quality data from tools like your testing tools, your monitoring tools, and then making automated decisions based on that data by comparing it to, let's say, what's happening in production, to previous builds, and so on and so forth. Now, in, in your work, especially with the organizations that, that you work with, um, is, there, is there anything that where, you've, where you see that, that people are still, like, what, what can people do to actually get there? Because I know we talked about it, it sounds exciting, it's, it's, uh, it's amazing. But still, we see that a lot of people still don't automate exactly that, either because they don't have good enough test automation so to get reproducible results that they can actually compare and have good data or other things. So what can you tell people of how they can actually get to that place where we can give algorithms enough good data so that we can then make better decisions in that process of delivery? So... Uh I'm I'm very opinionated about that, and I would say that people don't have automated processes and have those manual steps for for two reasons. And one is a good and valid; the other should go away. And and the the, the good is valid is hey, we're getting there, right? Uh, stuff is is hard to automate. There is a lot of human knowledge processes and bureaucratic. Uh, procedures that are not trivial to put in code and in automation is just is just not easy. But we understand that we want to do it, and we automate um, as we go. And in the end of the day, this should be the goal. There are others that I'm much less okay with that, and this is the concept of hey, we want to have this last minute human approval. Now, this one really pisses me off because the only reason you truly have that is to have a scapegoat. To say, well, if something went wrong, this is because it was their job to prevent it by not giving the approval. They went ahead and approved it anyway, and this is now their fault. Now, what really driving me nuts about it is that I think by now everybody realizes that machines can do much better validation work than humans. And what you do by, uh, by appointing this approver is actually you are putting someone in uh, jeopardy just by doing that. Because if you have a good automated process, you already checked more that this single person 
can eventually validate in the 20 minutes that they will look at it. And if you don't have a good approval process, then it's not this person's fault that you don't have a good automatic approval process. Just go ahead and improve your pipelines. So there is really no good reason for making someone an approver on top of the automated pipelines because they won't ever be possible doing the checks that machine already did. Think about performance testing. You have elaborate labs of automated performance testing with Gatlin, JMeter, Blaze Meter, whatever, you name it. And they hit your software with extraordinary load. And in the end of the day, your software pass those checks. And then you have an approval human that you ask them in the end of the day, is this software okay from performance point of view? What can they do? How can they bless or how can they reject the automatic tests? Mm. What, how, what, what more they know as humans than all the, all the, all the automatic pipeline that you have? Mm. The same with security. You have stuff like JFrog X-Ray that shifts less all the way to, um, to the developer. The developer adds a new uh, artifact and their ID complains that they have vulnerability. And then regardless of what they do, they have another check and they see I, and there are another checks and they see D. And those massive systems check tons of security vulnerability databases in the world and come to the conclusion that there is no vulnerabilities by the time that the human need to approve it. Mm-hmm. What possibly human knowledge can contribute to those checks? Mm-hmm. No, I, I agree with you. I mean, I think uh, it, it sounds a little bit like maybe you have also uh, listened to some of our stories and, and our <laughs> presentations because we are, we are basically saying the same thing, right? I mean, on the one hand, it is, I think, the lack of, I don't want to give up a particular position that I have earned over the years by becoming the performance expert that can look at two dashboards of two tests and then compare it within uh, you know, a small amount of time, but still manual. Maybe some people don't want to give it up. But on the other hand, I also agree with you. It is these uh, processes that are still in place in organizations that may not want to change for whatever cultural or whatever reason. I, I completely agree with you. And I think some of the resistance comes, and I think some of the resistance comes from the fact that, you know, people are going to resist initially and they're going to say, how is it going to know, you know, let's say the test gets rejected and because performance was poor. Well, I need to be a human to sit there and say, well, let me, let me look at why the test result was poor. Maybe there was a mistake somewhere in there because we need to get this out because marketing says it's got to be out tomorrow, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, what that really tells me is though that there's a breakdown in the process and that the humans should be instead of spending the time making decisions and researching if there was a problem with that test that time should be spent making sure that the tests that are developed the way they're developed how they're set up the data they're using is valid so that the when it, the data comes out for the computer to analyze everything along that pipeline has been, already been validated as being done correct and that's where the human comes in is in the design flow same thing we see when everything starts moving to an automated pipeline right you have your operations team who used to deploy code who used to order new servers and all they start coding the pipeline they start managing the pipeline and figuring out what tools need to fit into this pipeline so everything can be automated it's just shifting that responsibility right but if you don't think if people aren't initially thinking in that mindset they're going to panic and be like well we, we, we can't just put it out. Someone's got to look at it, you know, but do all your check. But that's, again, it's this huge cultural shift where all the, you know, we're in this time. So many of the conversations Andy and I have, and I'm sure, sure you do as well. It's all about culture, you know, absolutely. These cultural shifts that are, we're, we're, we're everyone's on the precipice. And it's that I, I, I go back to when I was a little ch- young child, maybe eight or nine years old. 
And I wanted to go, I went to the, you know, the public swimming pool and they had the high dive, which was maybe 15 feet in the air, you know, and I wanted to jump off of it and I was scared. I think, you know, it was like really, really scary. And the lifeguard saw me struggling. He said, okay, just walk to the edge, close your eyes. And when I count to three, you take a step. And I did it. Right. And it was the best thing in the world. Yep. But that's where everyone is right now. Like they're on the edge of that diving board and they're scared to take that step. And you know what? I get it. And, oh, yeah. and obviously, obviously that's fine. And uh, taking dive, it's, it's, it's one way to do it. Baby steps is exactly the opposite, but also like super, um, super useful. You automate parts of your process and you trust those small parts all the way. And next thing you know, everything is automated. Yeah. And you just, you know, you, you, you're done. But um, what, what I, I am upset about is um, the, the people that are set up for a failure uh, maliciously when we actually understand that this person cannot contribute more than our pipeline and uh, they are just there to take a fault when um, um, actually the pipeline that we build fails us, but we cannot blame it on the machine and obviously not on us. But here we have a scapegoat that was supposed to find this problem. How exactly? Well, by his title, he's the approval. <laughs> That's his job. And uh, obviously this is where um, um, it's, it's just th- they're there to take the blame. Mm. Yeah. Cool. Hey, uh, Baruch, I think we're getting at the, the end of our show soon. We've been almost here for well, almost an hour. Before we close, is there anything else that you want to you know, tell the audience that hopefully then motivates them even more so to download uh, your book or look up what you guys are doing either at uh, JFrog or what you are personally doing? Any, any other words? Yeah, so I'll make the ultimate suggestion uh, to, uh, to the listeners. Um, if anyone wants to just get the paperback version of the book, just ping me on Twitter, on LinkedIn, and I will ship you the book. How about that? That's an awesome offer. <laughs> yeah. Very cool. I hope you will enjoy reading it. I hope you will have some ideas on how to move towards liquid software and continuous updates in your organization, in your team. And um, let me know if I can be of any help. And again, ping me for the book. I will ship it to you. That's great. Very That's cool. awesome. Um, I just want to, in the end, conclude and reflect a little bit. So first of all, thanks for being on the show. Thank you for uh, having we'll me. Put the, we'll put the link uh, to, to um, you know, your Twitter and LinkedIn and everything. But I really enjoyed reading, and I'll just read out the title out, Liquid Software, How to Achieve Trusted Continuous Updates in the DevOps World. I really also thank you for kind of explaining to me that this is really about the next kind of evolution when we talk about continuous delivery and continuous deployment. It's about continuous updates. It's about thinking of right before we write code that the code and the architectures we build are built for being continuously updated, but not only from a technical perspective, but also the way we are defining new features and capabilities and how we market them, how we bring it to the end users. I think that's another big, big thing. I'm very happy that you enlightened us on the whole concepts of kind of uh, creating a fingerprint or I think as Brian said, the genome sequence of software artifacts. And so with that, we can uniquely track the whole lifetime and life cycle of artifacts, which will also be helpful for our line of work at Dynatrace. So I really want to follow up that conversation with you and see how we can also build, uh, you know, tighter integrations here. And yeah, uh, with that, I hope we will have you back soon because I'm pretty sure that movement is not over yet. There will be many, many, there's many, many years to come to help the world build better software and happy to have you back on the show at some point in the future. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Thank you for the invite. And uh, yes, we're just getting started. Uh, and uh, let's um, le- let's see how we can make it a reality. Uh, and um, obviously... Um, let's see how we can poke any holes in it and and see if it if it still holds water uh, with whatever objections um, you other people might have. Um, so Brian, thank you for bringing the uh, the topic of how you don't like the <laughs> subscription model. I think it was great. Um, 
thank you very much again uh, for for having me and talk to you soon. It's funny. I was just going to thank you for having that subscription model talk because it it, it uh, brought me a, a new vision on subscriptions, a more accepting one if what's behind them is done right, which I hadn't considered before. So oh, here you I go, think... liquid software for the wind. Yes, there you go. So really appreciate it. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for everyone for listening. Um, if you want to reach out to us, you can get us at pure underscore DT at, uh, on Twitter or pureperformance.diatrace.com for an email. We will have all Baruch's um, stuff up on, on, the, on the link. Uh, do you have uh, something? I think you mentioned it earlier in the show, if someone wants to follow you on Twitter or LinkedIn or something. Yeah, yeah. So the, the, um, obviously you're more than welcome to connect with me on LinkedIn, follow me on Twitter. Uh, but on the more actionable thing, pin me if you want the book. Great. Awesome. We'll have a lot of stuff in the show notes. Thanks, everybody. Thank you again. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.